Doc on the Run. We help injured runners run. Uh, today on the Doc on the Run podcast, we're talking about the importance of preventing preventable running injuries. Now, very few things are worse to a runner than a running injury. And if you've ever been injured, you know how devastating that can be. Of course, to add salt to the wound when you sit on the couch and recovering and you get weaker, you actually realize it's all preventable. So listen closely, you know, we all know that when you run pain is mandatory, but running injuries are optional, entirely optional. You do not have to do that. That's an elective problem. And today we have a special guest on the show and we're talking with the founder of RunRx, uh, uh, Valerie Hunt, and she is going to talk specifically about the importance of developing better running form and strength specifically for runners to prevent running injuries. Valerie, you should listen to her. She has 25 years of experience teaching runners about four-foot running technique, body weight, strength, and mobility, and flexibility exercises, all to help you run, stay healthy, and start running pain and injury-free. So again, she's the founder of RunRx, and she has over 100,000 followers and something like 5,000 posts of short explanations, video tips, and um, exercises that you can do to sort of get things moving as a runner that will help you reduce your risk of injury because they make you stronger as a runner. So fortunately for us, Valerie has agreed to come on the show today and help you understand why running injuries are not just common, but they're preventable. So Valerie, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you. Glad to be here. All right. So, yeah. So um, before we get started, since not everybody listening is going to know who you are, I mean, many of them will, of course, as many followers as you have. But before we get started, all the questions about running injuries and the things that we can do to prevent running injuries, maybe you could just give us a little bit of background about your running history and why you became so interested and passionate about injury prevention specifically for runners. Okay, great question. So I got into uh, working out or exercise in general. So I went to um my background is not running, which is pretty interesting because I think that's why I got injured when I started running. So I am a, my, uh, anyway, I got to UT, I went to UT Austin, Canise Major in 1990. And I don't you know, at, at that point I, was, I had been weightlifting, teaching some group fitness. So that's what I was really into then. And then everyone's like, you got to run outside. You live in Austin. So of course I start running, immediately start signing up for races and immediately got injured. Hmm. And initially people were really like, oh, that's okay. It's just running, like, you know, running hurts. Like it, it's like a badge of honor, you know, like people just, their injury is part of their running. And it became like, I mean, I got shin splints, I got plantar fasciitis. Well, meanwhile, I was still teaching 12 to 15 hours a week of group fitness. And that, you know, of course you're laughing now. I'm laughing now too. I'm sure that affected my ability <laughs> to be really, you know, re recovered for running. But my point was I wasn't injured from any of that. So why was I hurting myself when I went outside? Why is it that I could teach 15 hours a week of group fitness, high impact, kickbox, step, you name it, I was doing it. And then I go outside to run and it wasn't just me, but my clients were hurting. And since I'm a kinesis major, I was looking for, you know, I wanted an answer more than just it's your shoes because that's the mm -hmm. first response I got. My first answer, I went to the running shoe store, of course. We only had one back then in Austin. And the guy was really open. He was like, look, you know, you probably run wrong. So here, put these shoes on. <laughs> and, oh, yeah. And I found out I wasn't wearing running shoes. Like the, back then it was like, you know, I was wearing shoes that apparently were more for indoor exercise. So all of these things I was getting and I just um, I didn't like these answers. So I was fortunate. I found a book uh, initially on running, how to run and also how to swim and how to bike. So I started training for triathlons. And so I just was really lucky because in my mind, it was like I had a quest to find how to move better and not just for myself, but for my clients. And because I was a group fitness instructor, I taught everything and I had to get certified in order to be allowed to teach it. And I was the mm -hmm. aerobics director of my gym. So once I graduated college, I was, had my, my job and I had in order to teach step or kickbox or hydro fit or any of these specialty classes that I taught, I had to get the certification, right? right. So I was like, I don't have a running certification. So, you know, really for me, I was like, I got to find a running cert. Well, there really isn't anything out there, by the way. I mean, there might be more now, but I found this guy, uh, Dr. Romanov, and he's got the pose method. Mm -hmm. And so what's really cool about that is he had a study done and it reduces stress on the knees by 53%. Wow. So I'm like, that sold me. So I learned from him. Uh, I've been teaching it for with him for 16 years in general for 20 because I started with the book 
And that's the other thing, by the way, is that you start by now there's YouTube. Now there's so much video. There wasn't back then, right? So, right. you know, my, the way I found him was through the Triathlon Training Bible by Joel Friel. He was like the king as the king, the start of like the triathlon movement. And everyone that started in triathlon was immediately like skill is important to be a better cyclist, to be a better swimmer. And running still was kind of like, eh, you just run a bunch of miles and you'll get there. Mm -hmm. So that, that was my discovery. And I was so excited to find a way to learn that I was like, I'm going to learn it and I'm going to take it to my clients. And because I have no background in running, I didn't realize there was such a stigma <laughs> in learning how to run. <laughs> it's true. Well, that's great. I mean, I appreciate all the background there. And, it, you know, it's, so it is interesting because it's true. The, one of the things you said that so often people tell us, oh, it's your shoes. And the yeah. things I hear all the time, and the reason people call me for consultations is usually because they, they either go to a running shoe store and they basically, somebody says, oh, you need these shoes. They try them and they get injured again anyway, or they don't sure. get better or whatever. And then yeah. they go see a doctor and the doctor says, oh, well, you're running and running, you know, is bad for you. So you have right. to stop running. And I mean, you may know the story, but um, I, I can't believe I just forgot his name, but the physician who basically wrote the book on jogging as a way to sort of become healthy in the, um, the sixties and seventies, yeah. the seventies, he almost, he's in Texas and he, um, he actually, they filed an action against him and he went before the texas medical board yeah try and he had to defend himself to against losing his license because they said that jogging for exercise was an irresponsible move for a physician to recommend it and that people were going to die of heart attacks right. which that sounds so crazy now but to me today it sounds just as crazy when some doctor says oh well you have a running injury because you went running well, I mean, that's like saying you got an automobile accident because you drove a car. Well, sort right. of, but right. maybe it's because you were going 100 miles an hour in the rain um, <laughs> or you were driving 50 miles an hour in the snow. It's not right. really because you were driving a car. It's because you did something stupid. You know? <laughs> you, you know, you didn't stay strong. You didn't have good form. You did, you did 20 mile back to back runs. You did something right. foolish. It's not because you're running. It's silly. But right. that is sort of, unfortunately, still a lot of the advice is not to, well, figure out why you're injured, figure out why you're weak. You know, we want some simple answer like, oh, well, you have to just stop running or you just need different shoes. And it's ludicrous. So and then, you know, if you if you take that advice, anybody that's been in that situation where they've tried those different things and been to a doctor, you know that a running injury can really be devastating. And it's not right. just because you're not exercising. It's, you know, for us who are runners, the fact is, is we may be sort of unbalanced individuals or something but running makes most of us happy way better adjusted and when we get a running injury and we're told to sit still and recover it's just horrible because you know we're told to stop running and emotionally from an emotional standpoint being told to not run can be a serious challenge and many runners do in fact get clinically depressed when they're trying to recover from these injuries Absolutely. and they cannot exercise so you know Valerie I'm hoping you can help us really understand here like what you think it's like from this emotional standpoint when you're injured and, and an athlete is told that they have to stop running? Like emotionally, what do you think that does to them? Well, and I'll say this, spending a lot of time like I do with injured people, so I'm like an emotional dump. You know what I mean? Like people dump on me all the time. Like they're like, you don't understand how bad it hurts. I'm like, no, I do. Mm -hmm. I do understand. I understand one because I've been there. Um, I have had the plantar fasciitis. I've had a stress fractures. I've had shin splints. I went through a lot of running injuries to get to where I am, also from not moving well. And I'm lucky because on one end, I'm not, I was never the athlete. I've always been the coach and the instructor. However, my life depended, my life, my livelihood. I taught aerobics every day of my life for 30 years, yeah. right? I'm a group fitness instructor. I cannot be injured. So it actually, not just as an athlete getting injured, but what about if I'm a police officer? What if I'm in the military? What if my livelihood depends on me being able to not be injured, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's the emotional side is, is intense. And the thing is, is when you can give someone hope by you're going to not just correct your movement, you own it. It's your movement. So once you fix this, we don't have to ever see each other again. I mean, not really. I hope you know, but right. that's my goal. My goal is, Quit blaming, well, A, blaming. I have people always say to me, getting past the shoe, they go see somebody and they come in there like, I have weak hips. My glutes aren't firing. I mean, all of these excuses. And I'm like, what does that even mean? Do you even know what that means? I doubt it. Right. And, and if your glutes weren't firing, 
you wouldn't be standing up right now. You know, the, the bottom line is we think that we're supposed to control all of our movements and the way to fix things is like stretching. I mean, I thought to people like, come on, we're runners. Movement is the answer and correct movement is where you start, right? So if I'm injured, but I can still learn how to move correctly, there's my hope. As I'm in recovering, I can practice every skill I need to learn how to run because this is the best part. I can learn how to run without running. I can teach you, you can learn while you're injured. Isn't that great? I mean, mm -hmm. I can take time while I'm, this is the only good thing about a running injury. The only positive is I have to reevaluate my movement. I have to go back to the basics. I have to say, you know what? I was neglecting my stretching. So those things that are, you know, important, if you will, for self-care. But the reality is, is how much time are you actually, or have you ever spent on simply just learning the simple, natural way to run? And this is really cool, by the way, is that one of the things that people um, got hooked onto several years ago was that book, Born to Run. Do you remember mm -hmm. that book? Yeah, 2009. Okay. That just changed yeah. everything. So I met Chris McDougall, and I sat there the whole time like this with my hand up, just because I'm annoying like that. And, uh, and I've just been such a skill proponent for so long. And so many people read that book. And then they went and bought minimalist shoes or mm -hmm. went barefoot and went out running and they broke their feet right? because they had literally the weakest feet. It, they still do. That's not changed at, at all. But it right. was just like, I met him by the way at REI and I just, and, and it was sponsored by uh, Vibram shoes and all that. So anyway, I raised my hand the whole time and I said to him, would you please just talk a little bit about the importance of skill in running? Because I know in the book and I know in real life, he spent some time with Dr. Romanoff talking about these running methods. And he said, if they were sponsoring my book tour, I would. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> so honest. Mm -hmm. he said, you know, who's paying me right now? I mean, seriously, let's be real guys. It's a, it's a business. So he did say that it was very nice. And he said, look, if you, you guys don't be morons, learn how to run. He's from New York. He's very, you know, brisk. But the reality is, is that if we don't talk about it, that you need to learn how to do this, and when people take their kids to go learn how to swim or learn how to bike ride, everyone applauds that. When someone brings me a kid to learn how to run, people are like, what's wrong with your kid? Right. It's I true. Mean, why, you know, we sit up and down every day. I get up out of a chair every day, yet I still train every one of my clients how to squat. And mm -hmm. everybody that's a trainer will spend so much time and effort in teaching a squat. And then they'll say to their athlete, go run. These coaches right. are like, run harder run with more, I don't know, think positive thoughts or, I mean, all of these weird things that you tell someone, yet if I'm going to teach you how to throw a ball, I'm going to teach you every single mechanic I can. So you throw that ball a little bit harder, a little bit faster, whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. So why are we not doing that to our kids or to ourselves? And that is the beauty of what I teach is you don't, you need nothing but an open mind because you've got to shift your paradigm that running is movement. And in order to learn movement, I have to learn the correct technique to get there. And as soon as I l allow myself to do that, then I've got an ability to be like, okay, you know what? I'm not my running injury. I'm not a weak hip. I'm not a tight calf. Mm -hmm. that's what so many, you know, so many runners and I'll pause after this, but you might find this interesting. We have an athlete right now going for the Olympic trials, I believe, and she's had three heel stress fractures. And I saw right. you, you do a thing on heels. And she's, I believe she's going to run whatever's coming up. It's going to be her third marathon ever. And Nike made her a shoe that has a plate in the heel so that when she runs, it's going to protect that heel. Right. Now, do you really think that's going to help her heel heal? <laughs> yeah, right. Right. It doesn't make sense. I mean, uh, there was sort of this firestorm on Twitter a while back when I basically posted something about how I was going to do a webinar explaining how this was, I didn't make this up. And it was basically like how you can set a new PR with a stress fracture. I saw someone who, she had a metatarsal stress fracture. Um, and I saw her four weeks before her race, it turned out to be her fastest race ever. So not only did she do the race, she did it, she did not get worse, she did not get injured, and she had her fastest race her entire life, right? So I got this amazing backlash on Twitter where people were like, you're irresponsible. They should take your license away. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And then some guy posted, he said, 
I've had seven calcaneal stress fractures, you know, stress fractures in the heel. And right. I can tell you that running on a stress fracture is a terrible idea. And I replied to him directly. And I said, no offense, but there is something seriously wrong with you and your thinking and what you're doing. If you've got seven right. calcaneal stress fractures, you're right. You should not run on one of those. That's not what I'm saying here. This is a different thing we're talking about, but you know, you have to figure out what the problem is. And what you said there a minute ago was extremely useful. I mean, you basically said, isn't it great that you can learn while you're recovering, right? So you get injured, obviously you've done something wrong. And to me, the kind of obvious, and now it's because it's really weird to me. Doctors see an injured runner. They say, you're going to have to rest. You're going to have to recover. Take time off. Don't exercise. Let it heal. Basically, in short, sit on the couch and <laughs> wait for something miraculous to change. And then you're going to start running and everything's going to be glorious. And it may, to me, it's like a, a reasonable analogy would be to say, okay, somebody loses their job, they get fired, and they file bankruptcy because they've been completely financially irresponsible. Right. And their accountant says, oh, buddy, that really sucks for you. Why don't you just sit at home and watch reruns of Jerry Springer and your boxers, and then eventually somebody will hand you a job and your life will be beautiful again. It's ridiculous. No, you need to figure out, A, like if you're fired and you're bankrupt, you should probably be studying how to manage your money and you should be looking for a job actively at the same time. Runners, when they're injured, have to be, they have to learn what they've done wrong, what they can change, and they need to actively pursue those things while they're injured, not wait for this sort of miraculous right. healing process to restore them to something they never were before. Well, and here's another problem. So like I helped a guy out recently. Um, he had plantar fasciitis and he was trying to go, I mean, his, he really, whatever he wanted, he wanted, I think his ultimate goal was Olympic trials. He's not going to make it, but his coach, uh, when he got the plantar fasciitis, that was his exact response. Just do nothing for four weeks, right. for four weeks. Right. And then we're going to let it rest. We're going to let it recover. We're going to get you back out. So he saw my Instagram videos and he called me and luckily he lives here in town. And I met with him one time. We did a running session. He pushes off his back foot. He loads the calf every time. Got him to bend his knee. I mean, you know, it was just some simple, you know, corrections. And he was like, I just, it's just so frustrating. Can you imagine that he has run for the same coach for probably, I don't know, six, seven years at this point, because it was all through college leaving. And his answer was because he doesn't know and isn't seeking the knowledge because, right. you know, so many, it's unfortunate, but a lot of coaches, you've got these athletes that do well on your program. And then the ones that don't, we're not doing enough for those, right? Mm -hmm. Because there's no reason that any coach is saying to their athlete at this point, do nothing for four weeks <clears throat> or cross train. You know, that's right. my other thing. Like go ride a bike, go swimming. No. How about, which is fine for conditioning, by the way, I'm not against mm -hmm. that, but, if we're not taking those four weeks to rewire your patterns, to make sure you've got the correct movement, you know, learning anything, you know, here's running, it's the same movement over and over and over and over again. So any misstep is going to cause the issue. It's going to cause the error. That's who's, right. video who's videotaping these runners? Who's breaking down their analysis? Who's looking at it? <clears throat> and then what are they looking at? So this is what I want to get into. So the fun part of what I teach, and by the way, my client base, is really my age group and higher, mm -hmm. maybe even lower. And we're taking over running anyway. So I'm calling it like the running groups of the world. The, the moms and dads that love to run, love to do marathons, love to do 5Ks, it doesn't matter, or just go for a run. And for us, it is our lifestyle. Right. It is who defines part of what we are. We are runners. We are not the front of the pack, maybe. We don't have sponsorship names, but you know what? we're the ones paying for these runs. Like the reason there's 50,000 runners right. showing up in New York isn't for the one winner. That right. doesn't, don't get me wrong. I don't in, in any way put that down. It's to understand that we're growing as a community because we want to be healthy, because we want to be fitter, because we want to set good examples for our children. And I'm telling you, there's nothing worse than a mom who can't get her run in. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? You talk about depressed. Athletes get depressed and hundred percent. I have a woman right now who's a collegiate track athlete and she's now training for a marathon college days are over and she went out on the track was just having fun chased this kid sprinting and now has a potential tear in the meniscus we don't know but i'm telling you it's the depression is like immediate oh yeah of course you know 
guys, that's what we're here for. We're here for to educate you and say, you know what, here's the only good news. Here's the great news is that as you're developing, redeveloping your skill and you're getting your strength back and you're getting your recovery back, you're going to come back mentally stronger because once you do overcome that injury, you want to get back out there and you want to, you know, you really want to get it. So the basic, the basic of what I teach, the cool part of what I teach is it's so simple that I think it gets, it gets no play. Like in my mind, I can't understand how I've been teaching this for 20 years, how it's someone else discovered it before me 45 years ago. And it's just still never gets, I don't know how to say it. Like we're not generating enough excitement is, right. is I guess the way to say it. And I think it's because it's the simplicity of it and the challenge of it. So I teach, by the way, course clinics and one-on-one, -on -one, but I started doing online for six weeks. And initially people were like, oh my gosh, six weeks. And I'm like, it's nothing really. But mm -hmm. it's to develop that new movement pattern and to shift your paradigm. Because right. so many runners shut off when they run. Like they put on their Garmin watch and they put on their earbuds and they've got it mapped out. Boy, they know where they're going. They know how long they want it to take. They know how, what song is going to play. They have everything there. There's no connection to your body, guys. Your right. mind and your body cannot communicate with all these signals coming in. And what you've shut out is your own signal, like your right. own feedback. When people come to me and they talk to me about how long they've been injured and sometimes it's like six months and I'm like, what? Right. And they're like, yeah, I just, you know, I just try to tune it out. I try to just run through it or I breathe through it or I do all these things to get through it. And I'm like, God, your body is crying. <laughs> it's shouting to you and you're shutting it off with these sounds right. or these signals. So, you know, what I teach is basically the, the correct running position, the pose. And why is it called pose? Because when Dr. Romanoff was, watching um ballerinas you know they have uh, well, i think it's five or six positions they mm. practice they practice them over and over and over and out of them comes this incredible movement right? right and in order for them to jump higher in order them for their legs to split what do they do they stretch they're not spending hours jumping in the air doing the splits right they're spending hours practicing the correct pose then they add the self-care and the stretching and whatnot to be able to jump and to be able to do those splits i tell people when you're running the ability for your legs to separate in the air is simply you increasing your stretching and mobility. The right. hip has to be able to be mobile in order to separate. Your only job though, when you run, during your run, is when your foot contacts the ground, when your foot touches down, you wanna get it off the ground. You wanna minimize time on the ground, right? That's and minimize impact. Minimize, where, where do running injuries occur? They occur on the ground. So let's not <laughs> right. spend our time on the ground Let's run. And, and running by definition is both feet in the air. Right. So I tell people, when I ask someone, what, when you're going to go running, what do you think you're going to go do? How many people say to you, running is my freedom. Running is my joy. Running is my whatever. No, meditation. <laughs> yeah, 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 whatever. It's all emotive, though. But if I tell them, hey, I am deaf and blind. So tell me now what running is. What am I going to feel when I run? Right. What is it that I should be doing with my body when I run? That's what they don't know. Right? Right. That's why we see all these weird things happening. They don't know what to do, but they mimic what they see. What they see is arms swinging and legs swinging and things like that. So the, everybody's out there and it's just this weird um, bad dance move, <laughs> going right. on, if you will. So I tell them it's so, so fun to practice one move, right? It's a running pose. You stand in your running pose, and then here's the best part. You do nothing. You right. literally, you're in balance. You allow gravity to pull you forward. You act on your center to fall out of balance. You pull the foot up from the ground as you fall. So 60% of your body weight is already falling forward. You're pulling like 2%. You allow gravity to do the landing part, right? right. And then you just keep pulling the foot. And then you're running, you've got this wheel under you and you're running and it's just like the images. All of a sudden it's like, oh my gosh. But to get there, you have to be willing to, to put the work in. Well, that's so, right. So it's really interesting. I mean, you said this thing about how uh, ballet dancers spend so much time working on very, very specific poses so they can dance. And the same way you said, you know, everybody thinks you're crazy if you tell someone, hey, I'm getting my kid lessons to learn how to run. They think you're nuts. But they would not say you're nuts if you said, well, you know, my little girl's going to do ballet. So we have her in ballet lessons and she's practicing, you know, six hours a day. They'd be like, oh, that's totally normal. 
But you basically want to be able to say, oh, well, everybody knows how to dance. You don't need lessons for that. Why don't you just get on stage and do the Nutcracker? You know, that would be completely absurd. But, but still, we have this thing where running is supposed to be the thing that we do to train to run. Running only. No one does anything, you know, well, not no one, but you know what I mean. I mean, I follow an awful lot of people, and there are very, very few of them. Everybody's posting their runs, right? You know, their Strava data, they're posting a picture of them running in some beautiful place. I do that myself. Right. But still, are they actually, you know, posting these little peripheral things? Almost none of them. It's like there are probably, you know, a dozen or so people that on a daily basis, I see them posting these things that are actually crucial to us learning and developing better form, you know, and which makes it interesting because over the last decade or so, there's been this whole emphasis on form since Born to Run came out, this shift to talking about forefoot, midfoot, rear foot striking that really was not something that was openly discussed on a regular basis before. And now it's every day, even yesterday. Basically, I had a consultation last night with somebody who said, you know, for 20 something years, I've been running in, you know, big, rigid plastic orthotics with a supportive shoe. And I'm thinking about just straight transitioning to minimalist shoe. And I want to know, you know, if that's reasonable or, you know, how I should do that. I'm like, well, you know, basically in short, if you're going to run in custom orthotics and re really rigidly supportive shoes for 20 years, you, the base assumption is that you have weakness because you've been supported by all these things all that time. And if you just switch immediately to minimalist shoes, seems like you're kind of asking for trouble. Like, would you right. put somebody in a cast and then tell them to go do the high jump? Right. Seems stupid, right? right? But so, and so much of it just seems common sense. But he was actually told by a doctor, maybe you should just try this. And, sure. Yeah. Well, right. Well, yeah, you could do that. Magic anyway, right? Right. So, you know, but that's the thing is that there's so little <laughs> advice like that which you provide. I mean, you really have been incredible at sharing all these short really helpful voting you know videos that they I mean obviously are the motivating they're inspiring they're all the stuff that we expect from social media like Instagram but you know it's way beyond just the sort of oh look at somebody running in the Alps these are really instructional and helpful yes. and and will help us develop better running form and I believe prevent running injury and it also shows us that it doesn't necessarily require a gym or an expensive membership or fancy equipment to develop your running body as a stronger running machine. And, you know, the way that you, all of you listening to this right now, if you aren't following Valerie on uh, Run RX, it's just Run RX on Instagram, yeah. right? You should stop right now, pause this, go open Instagram and follow her at Run RX on Instagram. And you will be shocked at how much help you can get with literally like a 10 second video on Instagram. And, so that's one thing I wanted to ask you about. I mean, no, you, you know, you put an enormous amount of time and effort into creating all of these things for us to view and incorporate into our lives to become stronger runners. So, you know, what, what was it really that led you to become so passionate about strength training and, and form work for runners? Well, I'll tell you, um, when I first started, like I said, I was a group fitness instructor. And then as I moved into the outdoor world of endurance training, it just, it was beyond anything I'd done inside. Like I, it was just so much fun to get people ready for racing and triathlons and all that. So I opened my own training studio in 2001, went on, went out on my own and opened a little place and um, started. Um, my goal was to get people to do a combination of strength and endurance to see the benefit of both. Because when I started out, by the way, guys, um, Gold's Gym 1984 was my start. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, women didn't go in the weight room and i didn't accept that then and I was in high school so I had a lot of fun because I could walk to the gym from high school so I didn't play any sports but I went to the gym and this guy that was there he was the back then you were the sales guy you were the trainer you were cleaning the equipment Everything. so he he was great because he taught me how to lift he taught me how to do you know squats deadlift you know just basic lifts and I was always just like the other girls you know had been doing the stair master or whatever and I was bored I just found that really boring so I got into weightlifting and I was just an active kid anyway. But when I moved to Austin and I knew I was going to be a kinesis major, I knew I was going to be a personal trainer. I was like already there. Fitness was my thing. I love being at the gym. And when I was exposed to the outside, I was like, wow, this is like, I've got to put these together. And it's so funny now, but think about 1990. That was a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> and the girls were in the aerobics room and the guys were in the weight room. Right. And very few people were actually outside. When I started my very first running group, it was in 1995 and we met at like five in the morning and it was strange. And we were out on the street 
we were running and it was like exhilarating and we felt like we were almost like doing something wrong and then what's funny is because we were, we didn't really know or i didn't really know yet how to be a great trainer we would go back inside and then the girls would still go get on the stairmaster and still go do that you know what i mean they kept wanting to do cardio on top of cardio and i was like no right. no, no no we already did the cardio now it's time to do the weights so mm -hmm. that's when i opened my studio was to do we're going to go inside and do weights like 30 minutes like a strength circuit which back then i called hit training high intensity interval training and then you're going to balance that with going outside either swimming biking or running predominantly running of course and then that way you're going to get a mix of cardio and strength in the same workout and then you know adding the stretching at the end so that was always my favorite formula because i found that that way i these were this was my world i was in they were staying ready to race. They were staying injury free because as you know, you're a triathlete. Boy, when we got into racing, not just triathletes, but everything else, I, we were signing up all the time, Right. you know? Um, yep. So that the goal for me was not to miss a race, not for Valerie, but not especially for my runners. We were going to be out there every single, because I mean, you still see it. The injuries back then were just as bad as they are now. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, well, yeah. Not, Change. right we didn't have foam rollers and we didn't have tape and we didn't have things that were so obvious but um we were there's just been a constant stream of, of how do i prevent the pain and i found keeping people strong prevents the pain and in um 2008 uh pose went in with crossfit so we started then teaching into that community and they're they're the opposite they're like heavy heavy right. weightlifters and we hate running but it's a necessary evil so we'll do it and um uh, but what would happen is i'd go teach these clinics or teach these seminars and as soon as i would leave they'd forget everything i said or mm -hmm. romanoff or whoever had taught them like they could take it and they'd forget so when i first started making the content guys just so everybody knows i was doing it as a supplement right. because i didn't have any idea that social media would ever get to where it got because right. i wasn't raised on it so the first time we were putting videos out or i was putting videos out it was like for the people that had taken my class and couldn't remember what i said Mm -hmm. So this is just so you know, has been a hundred percent organic growth. Isn't that cool? Yeah, that is cool. Yeah. Uh, one of the things you said that's really interesting is about how, you know, we just like people even back then when there was aerobic, you know, fitness for women and weightlifting for men, that these women would want to go in and just do aerobic, 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 you know, same thing over and over. They still do. Right. Well, here's the thing is this, like a couple of days ago, I was talking with Mark Allen, you know, who is a uh -huh. six time Ironman world champion. It was called ESPN called him the greatest triathlete who ever lived. And we were talking about that specifically because when Mark started, well, there was not only was there not social media, there were no YouTube videos. Uh -huh. There was no knowledge of this idea of periodization and everything, you know, else that we have now is actual knowledge that you know, and science behind the way these things work. And Mark talked about part of the reason he believes that he was one of the only people who did not get taken out by a major overtraining injury and have to have surgery during that period when people would just run themselves into the ground because they didn't know any better. Right. Well, he basically said that, you know, it's interesting because it still happens today where athletes, runners, triathletes have so much trouble just realizing that, you know, when you go lift, when you do some limited strength exercises in small doses, it releases testosterone that causes muscle growth. You, you get growth hormone released. And, but we don't want to do that. We don't want to take time doing that. We have all these myths about how, you know, well, if we gain muscle mass, we're going to be we're heavier, we're going to be slower. And, you know, <laughs> running is what makes us faster. But if you're doing these runs where they're sort of not really slow enough base runs, your speed work's not really fast enough, you're not really doing weight training, your body basically quits releasing, you know, testosterone and growth hormone. And that sort of self promotion of healing and growth starts to ex get bigger over time, not smaller as you ramp up your running for that reason. And, you know, so in that sense, it's like we as runners are offering, we're missing these targets in training um, that, you know, have peripheral sources of strength. And that's why we get injured, you know, because we just want to run. It feels good to run. We feel like we're getting stronger when we're running. It feels good when we wake up in the morning and we're sore because we went for a long run or did some speed work. And then we don't do these drills. And all these short drills, adding to somebody's routine as a runner that you talk about and promote, I mean, I think you and I both agree that they will make you stronger as a runner. And form is everything. You know, being able to fully activate your glutes and large muscle groups 
is just like adding additional rowers in a rowboat when you're moving down the road. It just makes you more efficient because you're firing on all cylinders. And if you're not doing those drills, just like the ballet analogy, right? You're just not going to be as strong. Your form is not going to be as good and it's just not going to be pretty. So maybe you can share with our audience here um, why you think so many runners in some respect in their brains, they know the value. They believe in some respect that strength training is probably a good idea, but they don't really act on it or prioritize it. So why do you think that is? Well, I think, you know, I mean, you said it, the fear of being slower, the fear, and, and also the, if, uh, if my, so here's the answer I get a lot. And by the way, I, I hope everyone knows that when I'm talking about strength training, I'm not talking about weights. I'm right. talking right. about functional strength for your foot, for your hip, right. just right. to be able to hold your upper body up when you run. Watch older men that have been running for years and not strength training. They're all bent over. Right. You know, Way. You, know, <laughs> you guys have manopause. Um, sorry, but it's what it looks like. I mean, it's like, it's just the weakness. You see it happening in the spine as you get older. I, I think it's a, it's a combination of that. I really need to get my miles in. The priority is so much in the running. The satisfaction is in the running. The pride is in the running. That the things outside the running just are not important enough to get done. And so mm. what I try to do with, um, with my, with my runners and what I encourage people is just the simplicity and the, the shortness of what I'm asking for practice. Cause I mean, if you do 20 curb runs before you go running, it didn't change anything. You're not losing your mileage, but boy, being able to not, not being able to run for six or eight weeks because you didn't take the time to develop muscle elasticity makes no sense to me. And what, <laughs> what is also, you know, I mean, you think about it, but, as a culture of runners, you know, everyone's like, oh, runners are the healthiest. No, they're not. That's not mm -hmm. always true, right? I have a friend that Ironmans, you do Ironman. And he told me, like, if your family isn't checking to see if you have a disease and you're sick, you're not doing the Ironman. Well, that's not healthy. Right. You know what I mean? And, and honestly, I told him, like, that doesn't make you a better athlete. You starving yourself to make this race weight that you think is going to make some huge difference is the wrong mindset instead of, Am I fueling properly? Am I actually eating what I should? Am I doing my stretching and my self-care? I mean, if you brush your teeth, right, and you make your kids brush their teeth, we all do this, right? My kid never volunteers and stands up and goes, hey, guys, I'm going to go ahead and brush my teeth. Ever. Right. I mm -hmm. say, have you brushed your teeth? She lies. And then I say, go to the bathroom and brush exactly. your teeth, right? And I hope as she grows older, she'll do that on her own. But we're terrible as runners. And I was the worst, guys. I was the worst. Stretching was for old people. When I first started running, I thought yoga, stretching, we'd never use the word mobility. But that's what old people did. <laughs> I'm not kidding. It's true. Or I'd say to everyone, stretch when you get home. So it took me. It humbled me. It brought me down to be injured and to realize, wow. Stretching is part of self care. Stretching is like brushing your teeth. That's and right. it doesn't have to be hours. I don't need to do an hour of yoga. I'm asking right. for people to literally spend, I tell people, two minutes a day on your feet. Mm -hmm. Two minutes a day on your feet will make a, it doesn't be the same thing either. But, you know, it could be stretching the calf. It could be sitting on the foot. It could be doing some towel pickups with your toes. You know, make it just so it's something I do sometime throughout my day. Same, by the way. With, this, with the running training, and this is what I really want to get across to people, that when you're learning to run, when you add in what I teach, and you can go through the, it's a free tutorial, by the way, on my website, what I ask you to practice isn't even running. So it's not taking away from your running either. And it's only about five minutes of practice time. So that's right. the fun part. When you start to add this stuff in and you realize it's very little, it's just a little bit extra. And all of a sudden, because this is the really cool part, I do have a really large following, like you said, and I get almost no hate. Right. I don't get people. I used to when I first right. started. I used to. And I would argue back. I don't argue anymore anyway. But what I get repeatedly, repeatedly is people saying, I can't believe it. I was told I could never run again or my knees have hurt for three years. Or, I mean, all of these pains that they've lived with and accepted. And all they did was take literally five minutes right. of time to practice. So. That, that's yeah. what I want people to get across is that we think we don't have the time and it's just like preventative medicine. You may think you don't want, you know, like people that aren't exercising or aren't doing whatever, you know, that's always a response. You don't want to have to deal with the disease. You want to prevent the disease from happening. That's right. 
Yeah. And what we're talking about here is we're not talking about giving up your long run to go right. swim 10,000 yards in the pool. That's not what we're talking about. You know, we're not talking about skipping your speed work to go ride a bike for a few hours. That's not what we're talking about. And my, I remember years ago, my sister, who's been running marathons for decades, she told me that she, you know, she couldn't believe how literally just spending a very small period of time doing planks, doing core stuff, going to the gym, right. doing a little bit of other workouts to supplement her running fitness made an enormous difference in how much she enjoyed a marathon, right? right. Well, we know that. That's the thing. And it is a great analogy. Kids know they're supposed to brush their teeth. And when I put my kid to bed, you know, my son, uh, and, I, and I'll literally say, did you brush your teeth? Yep. Why is your toothbrush dry? And he literally <laughs> gets out of bed and just walks right past me into the bathroom. And I'm just like, come on, dude, really? You know? And but, but we do, we need we need that accountability partner for ourselves. We do. So it's yeah. really, I mean, it, honestly, it's like I swear, if we each had a running buddy, we say, Hey man, did you do your speed work? You know, did you do the <laughs> long run? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you uh, do your strength training? Well, not exactly. Well, did you brush your teeth? You know? I mean, that should be the follow-up question, you know, but we all know yeah. it, but it happens. So, you know, so why, why do you think that, you know, if you read the statistics, I don't think they're true, but, you know, I've read over and over that, that 80, you know, 5% of runners get injured on an annual basis. And I've like right. searched and searched for the actual reference. I found one that showed that like 79.4% of uh, runners in one study got right. injured on an annual basis in some variety, but it wasn't very specific about what happened to them. Um, so if we know as runners that the worst possible thing is uh, not running, just like if you're broke, the worst possible thing then is to not go to work, right? right? And it's the same thing. And so we know that that's not a good idea. We don't want to take weeks off, but still, regardless of what you think the percentage is, we know that running injuries are common. So why do you think runners get injured so much? I think no one's telling them that there's a way to run. I mean, I think yeah. it goes back to, like you just said, I went to the running shoe store. So I did too. When I very first started running, I went to the running shoe store. And then we assume this running shoe guy is an expert. He's not. He works at the running <laughs> shoe store. Nothing personal. He probably ran in college maybe. Maybe he's a really fast runner. But guess what they're doing? They're selling shoes. Like, right. for example, I went into a sporting goods store not too long ago. And they had a treadmill up and it said free gait analysis. I was like, oh, I yeah. can't wait. Right, of course. So here I go. And the kid's like, I don't know, high school maybe. So I'm running. And he goes, oh, you pronate. Yep. I said, oh, yeah. I go, do you know what that means? And he, yeah. goes, he goes, no. <laughs> yep. I said, I go, what shoes are you going to sell me? And he goes, well, we are overstocked on, these, on this brand. So my boss said, make sure to sell these and tell them they pronate. You understand? Right. He's selling shoes. True. And of course, he's a kid and I busted him out, right? That's all I don't care. I'm not going to tell on you. I'm just having fun. But this poor guy, right? But that's who he's talking. But guess what? Everybody that goes in that sporting goods store. They're going to get the same gait analysis. And oh my God, I pronate. Yeah. There's so just. There's something wrong with me. There's something wrong with yeah. me. So now what do I do? Well, here, I'll fix it with this magic shoe. Pronation <laughs> okay. control shoes. All right. So you understand. And then they use these, whatever, these big words. So I'm like, you better pronate. Like if your foot, if your, if your foot doesn't pronate, supinate, there's something wrong with your ankle. You got ankle mobility issues that we got right. to start dealing with. So this is what goes back to. Let's have this conversation. Let's have this conversation. Wait, before you, before you continue with that, let me just say one thing real quick. Okay. So I, because I lecture at medical conferences all over the world on running injuries, it has become my new hobby. Over the last 10 years or so, virtually every time I've gone to a new city, whether it's Washington, D.C. or Las Vegas or Florida, wherever, Seattle, I basically go to what seems to be, you know, the, the specialty running shoe store, right? Okay. And they do. I have been in, I don't countless states where I go in into the running shoe store and I basically just kind of mill around. Sometimes I buy some shoes, you know, just to try something different, but I will wait until they put someone on the treadmill, they videotape and then they slow it down and they'll say, oh, see right here where your heel tilts, where your foot comes down, your heel hits the ground and then it rotates. That's pronation. You need pronation control shoes. And I have heard that in all of these really fancy specialty running shoe stores where we think we have encountered the experts right. and, and they are the best places to buy specialty running, you know, running shoes is specialty running stores. I'm not saying don't go there. I think that you should. Um, I think that's better than ordering them online because at least you can get some input from somebody. But the point is, is that it is what you describe is exactly accurate. What I have seen over and over in these stores, they say you pronate. Now, everybody pronates. Pronation <laughs> is a natural thing. 
Right. So everybody pronates. It's when and how much that matters. And you can right. influence greatly when right. and how much you pronate. So anyway, having said that, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, you're right. It's like, you know, when you're a little kid, maybe second or third grade, and, and, you'll, and someone will say your epidermis is showing. You remember that, right? I don't know if you still do that, but it's like, you're like, what, 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 you know? Right. You know? So this is what we do is we scare people and we tell them that it's something that they do wrong, but don't worry, you don't have to fix it. It's okay. Right. You're not, we wouldn't expect it's you. It's not to your it. fault. Yeah, right. it's not you. It's your shoe, right? right? Well, we say, no, it is you. I don't care what shoe you wear, it's you. So that's kind of first and foremost is if we start talking to people like people, like a rational conversation, that any other thing we would do, like you and I went swimming, I've never been swimming. I start swimming, I'm not very good at it. And you're like, oh, it's your goggles. Right. You just had better goggles or swim cap. You would right. just be amazing. I mean, right. right? That doesn't make any sense, but okay. So we have to just go away with, A, also people have a real fear of their feet. And mm -hmm. it's funny because in all of my clinics, I say, okay, we're going to take our shoes off. And it's crazy to watch people's, first of all, they'll immediately look at me and be like, I haven't had a pedicure. I don't know. <laughs> all right. And I'm like, I have two broken feet. I have two botched feet. I came, I was not born here in this country. When I came, I had not, someone did, I don't know. They didn't buy me new shoes, I'll say. So anyway, my, my, I had uh, my, you know, my, I don't know how, what you call it, your foot doctor, you know, the hammer toe thing. Oh yeah. So my dad took me to Foot R Us and they cut the bones out of my feet. Mm -hmm. So over the years, I've got um, scar tissue there, but there's no support. So like long right. bike rides, things like that. I have full on nerve damage in both feet. And one of the toes is even dislocated. So I tell people, if you want to have a contest on ugly feet, I'll win it. <laughs> but it's all you got. What, and you're lucky you have feet. So take right. off your shoes and just be open to look at your feet. And we start with things like, can you just lift your big toe separate of the rest of your toes? Right. There's no communication with the foot. They're mm -hmm. like, they're looking at me like, oh my gosh, this is so weird. And I'm like, it's your foot. <laughs> right. So, but the thing is, is that the conversation still is the gate cycle. What I teach of the pose, pose, fall, pull is the gate cycle. And it gets repeated, repeated and repeated and repeated. Okay. So it's a repetitive cycle. The run part is when both feet are in the air. Mm -hmm. So what I tell people is I'm constantly teaching people. And if we're not talking about gravity, it has to be discussed. It has to be in the conversation. We don't put the foot down. We mm -hmm. pull it up. And every action has an opposite and equal response, right? So if my running partner is gravity and I'm pulling up, you have to let go of the landing. That mm -hmm. letting go, by the way, is a huge control, emotional, psychological issue. Right. Because... We're, we're runners, we're triathletes, we're type A personalities, I'm maybe the boss at my work, whatever I am, but everybody that runs is, is, has some sort of like, I'm running, I will pump my arms or reach my legs or all of this action because that's what makes them feel more powerful. And when you let go and you allow someone else to do something or even another force, we're talking about gravity, you're vulnerable, you're open, right? And I haven't done this before and it's a little bit scary. So someone needs to kind of take you through that just so you know, because it's not right. like you're consciously scared, but A, I'm learning this new movement. We're so used to walking and moving and running by putting our foot on the ground. Mm -hmm. No one wants to leave it unless they jump, right? right? In every other sport, by the way, in sprinting even, they use plyometric training where they do things like box jumps, right? For people that play volleyball, for people that play basketball, for people that do football. Yet runners, we do everything. We're so scared to leave the ground. When is the last time as a runner, you just did some jumps? That's mm -hmm. what I'm teaching people. We're not using, there's no muscle elasticity when you land on the ground, guys. I promise you. If you hit your heel or you try to land on your forefoot, uh, by the way, you know, midfoot, come on, that's the arch. This is, again, trying to control a natural reaction of the body. So mm -hmm. you're actually getting in the way. You know, your muscles know what to do. Your muscles respond to body weight. Body weight responds to gravity. Gravity responds to the mass and the movement. So there's like a linear thing going on here. And when you get in the way of that, so when you reach your foot out, gravity was already taking care of the landing. You went ahead and crash landed. Right. You took away your own time where you could have been having fun, running, spending time in the air, doing nothing, just hanging out. 
Instead, you're like, no, I'm going to take my foot and I'm going to crash land it into the ground. And that's why those shoes are so important because everybody, you know, they can't feel it as well with the shoe on. But the reality is, is if you just take the shoe off, you're not learning anything. Right. Maybe you'll pick your foot up a little quicker in the beginning because you've not felt your feet, but you're still not learning. You're still not communicating. And you know, the only communication your mind has to your body is where it can feel where it is. So when you're sitting, right, that's why we're called get kind of dumb sitting, right? All the blood sitting in your butt. When you're standing and your foot's connected to the ground, it's connected to your mind. Right. So when you're walking, when you're moving, your brain recognizes where it is. So when I'm telling my foot to pull, when I'm responding, you know, using gravity, ground reaction force, muscle elasticity, pulling that foot up, it knows that. And then gravity knows where the ground is. I mean, it's just right. a really incredible cycle. And as smart as most runners are, by the way, I find that the running community is a higher intellect. Um, and that's been the really cool part of being on the internet is so many people that are connecting with me. I've got a woman in Iran translating everything to Persian and these people are reaching oh, wow. out and they're like, we're running. Like they're so excited. They don't wow. have a specialty running shoe store. Right. right. And some of the women even reach out to me and they're running in private because they can't mm -hmm. go out running in the street right. because they can connect with gravity because they yep. can take their own body and mind and work with their own ecosystem. We're all in the same system. So I just, for me, it's such a great thing to work on. And, be, and by the way, everybody that um, kind of opens their mind to it, wow, like they start breathing better, they start relaxing more, right? Because all of a sudden I'm letting go and letting go is, you know, releasing some of that tension you were holding. Right. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, you said, you know, when you basically, if you're barefoot, you remove this sort of cushion that sort of allows you to do stupid things in a way, right. Right? right? And I mean, if you think about NFL football players, right, you'll see them, these huge guys, powerful guys running full force down the field and they head first into each other because they're wearing pads and helmets. Of course. You will never in a million years ever see two rugby players do that. They are not wearing helmets and they're not wearing shoulder plaids and they're not dumb enough to run head first into somebody else and crack both their skulls. But we put on running shoes and we're basically cracking our skulls every time we land We're running with bad form, you know, and it, like you said, it takes, it's this repetitive motion that you have to do over and over in the course of running efficiently and safely. And that's what you teach in your drills. And so, you know, you mentioned the tutorial a moment, which I guess in the, the free tutorial you have, of course, we'll put a link to that in the show notes for this episode so people can get to it. But is that part of what you teach them in the, in the tutorial? So yeah, the tutorial, the three, two, one really teaches the basics of the gait cycle. So I show you what is the running pose. I teach you what is fall and I teach you what is pull. And what's right. really interesting, by the way, so when I take it, but it's like, you know, you can't, the, the perception and really developing the correct movement pattern takes repetition, takes right. accountability. So that's why I started the online course. I'm your accountability partner. And I go in the course and I teach live daily. And the course has been six weeks and most people have actually gone and done it again. Mm -hmm. And why? It's because then usually what happens is during the first six weeks, life intervenes. Maybe they don't practice as much as they want. Some people are all in. Um, oops. Sorry. Some people are all in. Some people, you know, don't do the practice as much as they should. So what we found is we've kind of kept the community going, but, it's that accountability you need because you meet right. me one time or you take a clinic with me and while you're with me, there's so many aha moments because I can help you feel right. So mm -hmm. it's like when I'm, you know, I'm sure if someone comes in your office and you show them something and for that second, they're like, Oh, I feel that. And then they leave and they're like, what was that stretch you showed? You know what I mean? Right. It doesn't feel the same. So developing the perception of using gravity to move your body forward is a challenge. Yeah. And the more, layers you have the more challenge there is so when i work with kids they're immediate because they don't have any layers they don't have years of emotion they don't care <laughs> you know what i mean you're like oh kid and they're like okay so the older the people right and like i said i'm dealing with injured runners i'm usually dealing with people that have been running for years injured uh, right. i do have high school kids and they're great because again they're still open Mm -hmm. So the, the reason I, I did the longer course is, well, and I also found out people, they open the three, two, one run, the free course, they maybe do the first day and they quit. 
Right. And so many people, when they reach out to me, they say, oh, I have the pull. I'm pulling, I'm pulling, I'm pulling. And what I want to get across to people is to remember there's three words and it's pose, fall, pull. And pose is the position you have to be in. Falling is allowing gravity. So those are both gratuitous in your run. Pulling is your action. But if you try to run by pulling, you're just going to tire the muscle out. Right. You know, one of the things like strength training, if I said to you, I'm going to put a 30 pound weight on your ankle and you're going to go run 1500 steps for me, you'd probably not want to come back to my class. Right. But that's again, just like you said, when I'm trying to run by pulling or kicking or action, I'm putting a 30 pound weight on my leg and asking that leg to contract over and over. Right. And that's what we have to teach runners is that guys running really is fun. Yeah. Running is hard work. Running is suffering. Like you said, but in a good way, right? Like I'm breathing heavy. I'm working hard. I'm, I'm intense. If I want to be, I'm running fast. If I want to run fast, but boy, am I enjoying running, you know, mm -hmm. the running itself. And when you've had a good run, it's even hard to put that in words to somebody like what right. made it a good run? Well, I'm, I'm not hurting, but I hurt really bad. <laughs> you know, right. like, I love that feeling. And that's what I tell people like, and, and that's kind of the fun of strength training too, by the way, because learning to overload, like say you can't do a push up, or say a lady can't do a pull up and they can all of a sudden they get a little stronger and they can do 10 push ups. Well, when you're running up a hill and you're like, I can do 10 push ups, I can take right. this hill. It all, right. It all kind of comes together. Yeah, and absolutely. that's the beautiful part, right? To, yeah. to put this all together to make you more well-rounded just as a, as an athlete overall, but also just fun as a person. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. You know, a couple of interesting things you said, when you were talking about kids and adults and how different they are. And if you look at the studies on running form with kids versus adults, 85% of kids run as a four foot striker. But 74% of adults, 74% are heel strikers. So right. clearly it's learned behavior, right? Yeah. And yes. it's bad behavior. And, and it also, the other thing you said is that it, it feels good to just run hard. And like, if I run as a heel striker with really long strides, with really bad form, it feels like I'm working hard. And in my brain, that translates as, like you said, like a good run, like it feels right. like I'm moving fast. Right. And about 10 years ago or so, Newton's asked me to write a review of their shoes. And obviously with Newton's, you, it forces you to change your form. Uh -huh. And so I did everything that they said in terms of, you know, ramping up gradually. I only use them for speed work. And then my next marathon, which I'd, I've been running for, you know, 40 years. And so I had not just started running. I was not right. new. It's not like I had just trained more. I'd been consistent on my marathon times for many years. And the next marathon I ran was 20 minutes faster than my prior PR. Wow. 20 minutes is an eternity. Now, <laughs> when I posted the review of the shoes and I talked about this and stuff, there was some, of course, you know, there's some troll on there that yeah. kind of went off and he said, oh, well, you know, I could buy a new hat and get a new par, you know, PR. And I was like, well, you know, I'm not saying this is the shoes. I'm saying that I have learned, you know, the stuff that you teach. I didn't know about you then, right. but I was learning basically the things that you teach. I'd read some books on changing running form and using a tool to help right. me kind of in that transition a little bit. But it wasn't because I bought new shoes. It wasn't because I just got different shoes. And if I just bought the shoes and put them on and run, I would not have run faster, would have gotten injured. And right. You know, I mean, but the truth is, if if uh, if I had the only thing I had chained was my hat and I ran 20 minutes faster, the next time I would wear two of those hats, you know, Absolutely, yeah. but but it's not the hat. It's not right. the heart rate monitor. It's not the new, you know, pair of shorts that I got. It's the form and the form is something you have to learn over time, but it doesn't take a lot of time. So so right. for those people who are still doubtful, how much time a day do you think need people need to spend on doing drills? How much time are we talking about here realistically? Oh, five minutes. Okay, five minutes. Five minutes. So guarantee you, virtually every person that's going to hear this, see it, anybody who's going to read about it, whatever, there yeah. is no one who will not spend five minutes on social media each day who's going to get this, right? Yeah. So. What would you rather do? Spend five minutes on social media or five minutes becoming a faster, stronger, safer runner? You know, it seems absurd, right? To, to not do it given what you described. All right, right. So let's shift a little bit and talk about core strength. Like right. I know that, you know, most of what you talk about is really form related to the, like posing, you know, falling and, and then landing appropriately, right? As opposed to like crash landing. But what about core strength? So is that overblown? Because there are a lot of things that kind of become 
trendy. Like for a while, it was core strength is what you need if you're a runner because it's what not people don't do. And then it was um, for a while, it was like, well, your glutes and your hamstrings aren't firing, you know, because right. you're an endurance that's, athlete. That's my, that's my favorite. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, I mean, right. So like, you know, oh, you're not using your glutes or your hamstrings. Is that really possible? I mean, if you cut your glutes no. or your hamstrings, what would happen? You know, well, do you think you could run? We, we, we revere, we idolize the Kenyans, that these marathoners coming to us from, from remote parts of the world that right. I guarantee you did not grow up going to a gym right. and doing Pilates. You know? <laughs> I mean, like, let's be real. The, the reality is the strength comes, the strength is necessary. If you want to run faster, if you want to <laughs> run longer, you have to have the ability to hold your shoulders over hips, period, end of story. Right. Where runners break is their inability to hold themselves up anymore. Why do you have to start walking? Why should you have to start walking instead of just slow down your run? I mean, mm -hmm. honestly, think about it, right? Because right. they can't hold themselves anymore. They literally cannot hold their body up. Right. So a lot of the people that we look up to in running that, by the way, running all these miles, they're running and they're gaining their strength from very early childhood up, right? Most of the runners coming from these other countries will say, I ran to get food for my family or water or whatever for years. We didn't. Right. Right. Most Americans grew up not doing that. So well, now our kids, let's face it, our kids, they won't even go to the grocery store to get food or water. Someone will bring it to their front door now. <laughs> right. It's, it's true. Yeah. It's embarrassing. And so, but my point is, so let's be real that most of us, um, and I don't sit. I'm a standard, right. but it doesn't matter. This whole culture we're in, we don't have that background of all these years of standing and standing in the correct pose or position. So yes, most of my runners or most of the people I know do need to do strength work, starting from the foot yeah. all the way to the head. Yeah. So what I believe is, yes, you have to add some supplemental hip exercises, but like full body, like planks, like you were saying. And right. we do things like dynamic planks, you know, squats, lunges, step ups, push ups, very basic mm -hmm. body work, you know, like military people do, but right, right. it's well, how, how else do you think your body's going to perform if you're not strengthening the muscles? Like we have a, mm -hmm. you know, it's just like, you're saying, it's like, um, why don't we do these things that are good for us? Yeah. And I guess it can go all the way back into your diet. Why are you eating the cookie when you know maybe you should, you know, it's like, right. why do we do these things or not do these things? And it's all in the value of not just uh, it's the value of your time and yourself. Mm -hmm. And so I, 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 core is like, and I use the word core still too, by the way. And after it is, <laughs> I say, pull your stomach and squeeze your butt. I stay real basic with what I say, but most people, by the way, don't even really know what their core is. And so you have to educate on all that. So right. when I go, when I take people through strength stuff, I do the same thing. I start with like, put your hand here, put your hand on your own glutes, do these things to feel. Cause again, we've disconnected so much. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, I do believe that we all need to do things like full body strength, but not crazy things mm -hmm. like push ups, like, you know, just normal sit ups. Like why did we switch from sit ups to crunches? Because right. they're faster and it was easier for people to count on this. I mean, you know, you look back on some of the things we changed in PE for our kids right. and it was nothing to do with the health of the child and everything to do with maybe standardization or time. So I tell runners, if you've got time to run 50 miles a week, you've got time to do five minutes of a warm up. And, and if we could get running groups, because so many people run with a running group, right? There's a lot of individual out there, of course, but a lot of groups, they'll stand there and talk for 20 minutes. Yeah, right. Before or after the run. And I'm like, that's a prime time to do some drills as a group. Make it right. so it's not weird. It shouldn't be weird for a runner to walk up and before a run to stretch or warm up or do a running drill. But I'll tell you, it is. It's mm -hmm. not. Most people go from their car. You watch them. They get out of the car. They walk to where they're running to. They're adjusting their music. They're checking their whatever their watch. And they start running. That's right. I see very little like foot and ankle work before the movement. I'm, not, I'm looking at where's the ankle rotations? Where's the ball of foot hops? Where's preparing my body for what I'm about to do, right? right. Yep. Yeah. So, you know, one of the questions I was hoping to ask you, but I think I'm actually going to skip that. But that question was basically trying to pin you down and say, you know, out of the hundreds of videos you've made, if there was one drill that would be most effective, what was it? But the fact is, is it's irrelevant because what you're talking about is some very short 
repetitive things that really total five minutes anyway, right. you know, and that you don't really have to choose one. We're not talking about, you know, where you go to the gym and you spend five minutes doing bench presses and you spend five minutes doing lap pulls and you spend another five minutes on the rowing machine. And then two hours later, you're back home after you yeah, driven yeah. there, checked in, did your workout, took a shower, drove home again. You're talking about a few minutes that you can do without specialized equipment and easily fit into your routine, right? I'm talking about in the parking lot before you go run or where, you know, do it at the house if you don't want your friends to see you, you know right. what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the same thing, as soon as you finish, you do one round of an active recovery exercise. The best time to do a little bit of hip strength, guys, is right after a run, get the elasticity back, and then you're done. And you can right. make it all happen in whatever your time frame is. That, mm -hmm. That's my, you know, when I train people, that is the number one thing they always tell me is that in the beginning, they're so stressed out when they see their training plans, they're so fitting in their runs. Well, if you as a coach or you as the runner don't make that time in the running, then it's like, I know I'm going to be out for an hour. I know I'm going to be out for an hour and a half. And then I have my, if, if you're that, you know, ordered and you're like, okay, I'm going to either plug in that extra five minutes on each side. So I'm going to give right. myself an hour and 40, or I'm going to put it inside that hour and a half, make your time mm -hmm. count and make it valuable for what you're trying to do. Yeah, I know. That's great. Yeah. All right. So I just have a couple of other questions for you. One of them, you know, we talked in the beginning about how um, runners, seem to like sort of, as you said, they kind of, I think you said it's like um, that they kind of obsess on or they have pride in this kind of pain, you know, from being injured and, oh, yeah. and that running injuries are optional. Running with pain is option, optional and you don't have to. That's part of what you teach is that you don't have to run with pain. So why do so many runners run with pain? Well, I think, you know, as, as a runner that's run with pain also, we don't want to miss a run. You know, right. again, it goes back to why am I running? And if running is like what makes me feel that great feeling, then I don't want to miss that run. And if no one's told me, I think it just goes back to I didn't know. I mm -hmm. didn't know there was a way to run. And by the way, you know, I've been really fortunate. I, I used to live in Austin for 29 years. It's a very, very uh, competitive running community over there. I moved into a tiny little town. I live in a tiny little town here in Texas now. And the... Uh, community is completely 100% the opposite. There is no running community, very small. And as soon as I moved to town and someone got the word that I was a running coach, people have been sending me their children, the moms call me, dads call me, and yeah, they're all hurting. And right. it's like I opened this door that it's okay to talk about. It. I mean, I was at, and a lot of people do boot camps around here. I mean, literally, I was at a park with my kid one day, and this lady goes, Valerie, 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 look at my husband run. He's terrible. Go tell him. <laughs> Go tell it right. That's a way to make friends. Yes. But what they all say to me <laughs> is they'll say, give me that one stretch. Right. Or give me that one move. Right. I'm like, there isn't one. I would be rich if there was the one. <laughs> well, no, seriously. It. I mean, even you know? somebody like Dave Ramsey, right? Who, you know, he, everybody calls him like, what's the one thing I should put my money in? And he's just like, I've been doing this 30 something years. We taught millions of people how to be rich. I have my money spread across all these mutual funds and mutual funds made up of all different kinds of money. I have five different kinds of mutual funds. There is no one thing, you know, and everybody, but we want to do that in running. We want one pill to make us skinny. We want one thing that we put in our smoothies that will make everything miraculously heal when we're injured. We well, want because the marketing sells it to us. It's exactly right. I mean, you know, the, the, I, I, and I'm not blaming them, but like the Hoka shoe right now is so hot. And I look at that shoe and I'm looking at it like, why would you put that on your foot? I mean, to me, it looks like a monster, right? I've been minimalist for so long. And, but boy, they're selling it great, right? But it's like running on clouds. You can hammer right. downhills. You can float. You're not even, you have to do nothing but put on this shoe. Right. And, and what floors me is when you talk to someone individually, when I get someone by themselves and we start having a conversation, I never say to someone, how did you believe that? You know, like right. what good would that do? Yeah, right. But when I tell them and I educate them and I talk to them of the why of what's going on with their body and their foot or, their, you know, whatever. And they're always like, gosh, I don't know why I never thought about it. They don't either. They don't see it. Right. They don't see they've been talked to this way. Or, you know, if your PT isn't, you know, by the way, the pose method is only credited running certification for physical therapists, right. nothing else out there right now. So I tell my runners when they tell me they went to a PT, did your PT mention to you that there's a way to run? No. 
then right. that's not the PT for you. And I think that has to be also discussed. Where are the injured runners going? They're going to the shoe store. They're going to the PT. They're going to the Cairo. They're going to these people that are feeding them a, another lie because that you bought the shoe. Then you go to your PT, your Cairo. And I'm not saying all. There's a bunch of amazing people out there. But some, and they say, well, your glutes aren't firing. So mm -hmm. then all of a sudden it's like, oh, well, great. All I got to do is I can still wear my, my magic shoes and do these little bands exercises, you know, whatnot. Right. And, and that's where we have to have the conversation to say, guys, the band exercises are great. All those rolling devices are great. There's a lot of good stuff out there. Use those as preventatives. Use right. those to keep the injuries away. But we know you're injured right now. And what we want to do is get you out of that injury, get you stronger. So you don't have to use all those things. And that really just requires you to do a little bit of work. Okay. Yeah, that's great. And that's true. So I guess that's basically the premise and the idea behind three, two, one run five days to run pain free. Right. I mean, yes. okay. And they don't do the five days. <laughs> yeah. Right. Funny. Yeah. That is funny. Right. So that's that whole thing of like, if we could give you like, even with antibiotics, I saw somebody yesterday, he's an athlete. And I said, you need these antibiotics. And he was like, and I really have to take it for 10 days. I'm like, only unless you want to get worse. I mean, come on. It's like, like, man, you called me because you have right. so much pain. You can barely walk and you want to, you know, ride your bike. You want to run, you want to do this. And you're going out of the country in a couple of weeks. Right. Like, come on, dude, are you serious? But we want, can't you just do one thing right now? that will fix all of my problems and make it go away. It's like, no, we're not ordering ink from your printer from Amazon. You know, it doesn't work that way. So, uh, but anyway, sorry about that distraction, and but you know, it's, you're right. And by the way, like what I teach, I tell people like it's free. I mean, right. I charge for my, for my service, but the, the learning the the value that you don't need anything that, that to me is like, you know, and, and ultimately I hope as I get older and I hope as I get more out there that I can get into schools and I can get into more where it can really make a difference. Right. You know, like we've been, we're in the military, the U S military is using the, the running technique. I, I got, I've got a guy, I Skype with him. He's in Iraq right now. Um, I'm, I mean, I'm telling you, it's like the people out there are hurting and right. they're tired of being told that it's something they have to fix with either a tool, a shoe, a machine, a, a, you know what I mean? Like, right. no, it's, it's, you don't have to go, you know, these treadmills are putting out for these people and all these things. And I'm like, man, if they just had a rubber band, I know. just feel for just a second, how cool it is to use your hips to move forward. Then you would want to strengthen your hips because right. then you would feel, why do I need my hips in running? Right. So many people think running I've had men over the years, they'll come to training. <laughs> they say, I don't need to work my legs because I run. Yeah, right. Like, you never heard that? I, I totally. Mean, all the time. And I'm like, dude, look at your legs. <laughs> There's, it's, it's exactly right. We have so, so many of these things that when you actually say them out loud, they just sound a little silly. And, yes. you know, and I have seen runners that I actually really believe if we said, hey, you have two choices. You can stop running or you had cancer. Which one would you want? They Half of them would like really think about it before they made a choice. But if anyone went to a doctor and the doctor says, you have cancer. However, we have a plan that is going to fix that in five days. You could say you have to stand on your head in glass for five days and 100% of people would do it. But when you come up with a way to basically get people to learn how to run pain free in five days, runners balk. Which is crazy. Because, because the paradigm shift isn't there. Yeah, yeah. You all right, so tell that. us what runners are going to learn when they enroll. All these people listening, when they sign up and they enroll in 3, 2, 1, run, five days to run pain-free, what are they going to learn from you? So what you're going to learn, and it's just a little video thing, um, is you're going to learn how to stand in the running pose and how to stand in what's called the ready stance, which means mm -hmm. how should I always be standing? I should always be ready to move, I call it. So it kind of helps you to stay aware when you're not running, how am I standing? Where am I in space? Uh, I teach you the running pose. I teach you how to fall, how to practice falling, and all you need is a wall. And I teach you the running action of the pull, like the actual pulling using the hamstring reflex, because that's really cool, guys. Like, there's no machine to use it. It's just you. You can't learn the pull with anything but just your body. And then you learn how to put it all together. I put a little practice thing there for you. And you can even reach out and talk to me and ask me questions. Yeah. And that's it. So, and I think I teach a couple of drills, like the ball of foot hop is in there. So what happens then, once you've gone through that, 
Then you start watching my Instagram page and you've got a daily practice right. because you've got the base. And by the way, it never goes away. Like still to this day, 20 years later, at some point today, I'll stand in running pose. I'll practice 10 falls. I'll do a couple of pulls. I mean, I've already gone running today, so I already did it. But you understand it, the, the practice is nothing. Like right. 10 pulls takes 30 seconds. Standing in pose takes a minute. Pulling, you can do 10 or 20 on each side. It's the consistency and repetitiveness of the practice. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit of practice. It doesn't even have to be when you're running. And that's right. why I talk about you can do it when you're injured because um, once you're weight bearing, you can stand in pose. You can practice falling all the time and pulling. And you can practice some of this stuff, even non-weight bearing. And if you are really injured, you could just reach out and ask me for modifications. But you'll see in the practice that it's just really like, oh, I just need to connect with my center. I need to make sure I'm holding myself in the correct pose. And I just need to learn how to pull my foot. And and I don't be great. Like, I don't want to say it's just, it's just, but that's the fun part of what it really just is. Right. And then it's just repeating it. And then the drills just become a fun way to reinforce what you're already kind of practicing. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. That's great. Yeah. All right, Valerie. So all we're right. going to put all those links on there so people can get there, sign up and, and figure out in only five days, the stuff they really have never learned. No offense to everybody listening. But the things you really don't know that you need to know to continue to run stronger, run faster, and stay injured a lot easier, you're going to learn all that in five days. We'll have all the links there where people can get to there and sign up. And, and of course, links to Instagram, everywhere to follow you so they can get those daily refreshers and those drills that they can do in a few minutes a day in less time than it takes to drive to the gym. Right. right? Yes. So we'll have all that stuff on there, but I really and truly appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to come on and share all this with us today. I think it's really going to be hugely helpful for a lot of people. So thank thanks for so much for coming on the show. All right. Thank you. Doc on the run. We help injured runners run.